Hello everybody and welcome back to Psychology 101. This is lecture 5, I believe. We just finished up talking about Carl Jung and analytical psychology. So now we're going to kind of get into the bare bones of uh, psychology, uh, talking about explaining human behavior. So this is going to take from that Psychology Principles textbook, the uh, Tarvis and Wade book. And so we're going to talk about some of the principles in the book. They're going to talk about pseudoscience and psychobabble, thinking critically and creatively about psychology, psychology past and present. There's a little bit of the birth of modern psychology and psychology today. I'm not going to go a whole lot into that just because we did the uh, the first four lectures as kind of an overview of the history of psychology from philosophy to the early physiologists to Freud and Jung. So not really going to touch a whole lot on that, but we'll talk about the major psychological perspectives and the two influential movements in psychology. And so, pseudoscience and psychobabble. So, you know, in recent decades, there's been a market for easy, quick fixes to emotional problems, which are nothing more than quackery and pseudoscience nested inside of psychological language. Uh, some examples of this would include what they call primal scream therapy. That's where they recommend you go up somewhere out in the woods and just scream your bloody lungs out until you feel better. You know, methods of reprogramming your brain. There's even been some self-help books that kind of use that psychological language, but it's not really nested in any sort of uh, psychology at all. Uh, I would say that, you know, there are some books about personal growth that you can get that are rooted in psychology that are actual good self-help. Uh, there's cognitive behavioral therapy for dummies, which is good for practitioners, and it's good for, like, if anybody's trying to sort themselves out and improve their lives in some sense so they can take some of the principles that's actually used by uh, clinicians uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy to to do that and of course uh there's uh 12 rules for life by jordan peterson's a self-help book and it's actually got a lot of uh kind of cliched uh wisdom in within within the 12 rules but there's also some psychological literature that kind of backs some of that stuff up so it's not uh necessarily pop psych or pseudoscience or you know uh psychobabble it's actually grounded in actual psychology of course it was written by a clinical psychologist and uh the difference between pseudoscience and psychology is basically that psychology is rooted in empirical methods and derived from observation experimentation and actual measurement so you could look at that as a uh, you know evidence-based practices what we know works and what's been applied and so now, because so many pop psych ideas have filtered into the public consciousness, the media, and even into law, there needs to be a clear line that's drawn between psychobabble and psychology. Uh, one of the things is like, you know, you hear about police officers being able to detect uh, who's telling the truth versus who's lying based on body language and all of that. Um, most law officers that are taught to detect deceptions do a little better than like chance. So there might be a 51, 49 percent chance that they can detect deception, but you know, 49 and 51, that's almost dead split even, you know, chance that they would get that right or get it wrong. And so the line between popular public opinion and findings that are backed up by pure research, that's the line between psychobabble. It's just, you know, popular public opinion, like old wives tales and whatnot. Whereas you have actual psychological data that's backed up by peer-reviewed research, and we'll talk about peer review in the next section of, of – or at least in the next lecture, we'll really dive down into why peer review is so important. Um, is the reason people are unhappy because of repressed memories? As we'll learn in this class, that common beliefs often are contradicted by actual research evidence. Now, there are different competitors with psychology such as palmistry, fortune-telling, and astrology. Uh, most people tend to think of their astrological signs of, you know, based upon the month that they're born, the constellation under the sun is responsible for your temperament or responsible for your behavior in certain situations, and that's just wrong. It's, it's bloody wrong. And anybody that tries to peddle that to you, basically they're peddling you psychobabble. They're 
pop psych. It's it's pseudoscience. There's nothing scientific about that. We know empirically that biology has a lot to play in a person's temperament, and it also has a lot to play within their personality. But that's more of a biopsychosocial circle of how that works, because your temperament's rooted in biology, and then of course your social interactions with other people kind of also tilt you as far as to like how agreeable or disagreeable you're going to be, uh, how positive emotion sensitive you're going to be, or how sensitive to negative emotion you're going to be and all of that. So there's a lot more to temperament and personality that's rooted in actual science than your sign under the stars. So uh, just want to put that to put that to bed. There are now there is some interesting intermingling between like say tarot and psychology but we we talked about that in the Carl Jung lecture talking about the archetypes and archetypal representations and open-ended questions so it's almost like psycho it's almost like psychoanalysis but with visual aids and there's really no training for it whereas to be a psychoanalyst you actually have to be trained which we can talk about as we go further into the into the lecture here so thinking cre critically and creatively about psychology so there's some critical thinking skills you need. You need the ability to analyze data. You need to be able to critically reason things out. You need to be able to base things on their logical conclusions, be able to evaluate it. Decision-making, problem-solving, all of this is part of critical thinking. So basically, critical thinking is the ability and the willingness to assess claims, make objective judgments on the basis of well-supported reasons and evidence rather than just emotional and anecdotal evidence. Just because you feel something's true doesn't mean it is. There, there's a there's a social psychologist by the name of Jonathan Haidt who wrote this book called you know The Coddling of the American Mind, and he talks about the great untruths. And one of the three great untruths is that you should always trust your feelings. And no. You should. You should always trust truth and evidence. You shouldn't always trust your feelings because, because if you feel something's true, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. And you're going to find yourself very uncomfortable in the face of evidence that contradicts your feelings. That's what they call cognitive dissonance. And so critical thinking also involves looking for various reasonable explanations for events and applying new knowledge to social and personal problems. You can think of that as Occam's razor. And that's based off a philosopher whose first name escapes me, but... Anyway, Occam's razor just simply says that the most simplest explanation for something is obviously the most true solution to a problem. So always looking for the simplest explanation is often the most true. That's the principle behind Occam's razor. And critical thinking isn't only useful in psychology and science, but it's also very useful for everyday life. Uh, you know, we're bombarded with all kinds of different conflicting uh, news and information regarding this whole coronavirus thing. So you have to have the ability to be skeptical, think critically, and look for evidence that backs up whatever claims you read so that way you're not buying into you know, whatever it is that someone's trying to push. You want to stand outside of all of that and think you know, for yourself and think critically and be skeptical. So critical thinking is useful for that. And in the field of psychology itself, I mean, you got to have you know, psychology studies, reasoning, problem solving, creativity, and other aspects of critical thought. So, I mean, you're going to be in this bubble of critical thinking all the time. And so you're going to have to get used to being in that skeptical mindset, especially going forward. So the eight essential guidelines are critical thinking. Ask questions and be willing to wonder. Because you want to ask questions that will permit many different answers so that way you can kind of guide your own research into some things. Like one of uh, one of my things I'm interested in researching is, is there a dimensional approach, to pers dimensional approach to personality pathology, personality disorders? Is there a way you can map them out empirically along the big five going based on like the diagnostic criteria, the observed behavior, and, you know, what they've figured out as far as, you know, one of the big therapeutic modalities for borderline personality disorder, for example, is dialectical behavioral therapy. So looking at how the mind works in that, you can kind of 
plot out along the big five where you can possibly see the scores that are you're gonna you're gonna see you know a lot of emotional instability that's high volatility so from a big five perspective you're gonna see higher scores in say trait neuroticism probably lower lower scores in extroversion you're gonna probably see agreeableness probably down toward the low end of the spectrum you're probably gonna see a lot of high openness and maybe uh high conscientiousness as, as far as orderliness goes because people with borderline personality disorder kind of like to have things in a certain order because of their fear of abandonment so they have to have this this they have to have control of a situation so that way they can kind of mitigate the, that that fear of abandonment whether it's real or imagined and like i said there's uh, a lot of instability within interpersonal relationships there's a lot of emotional volatility and so you're really, it, it, it's really going to be interesting to see if we can actually pinpoint those personality disorders within a big five perspective. And so that's a question you can ask. And it's one that you can get different answers to. It's like it could be yes, it could be no, it could be a bit of both. We don't know. We have to come up with a, with a reliable instrument to measure that that's designed to be measured in a big five uh, model and then go by like the actual behaviors and stuff. So, I mean, you've got to have your markers go. Define your terms. You can't have poor, broad definitions of terms in any sort of experiment. And the reason for that being is you're going to have these incomplete answers and it's going to be easy to fill in that based on your own biases and you don't want to do that. You want to examine your evidence. You don't want to just accept something by feeling. You want to actually look for the evidence. And I've been lucky enough in my own research that I've done academically the the evidence has always has disproven my initial presupposition and i always go by the presupposition that what i think to be true is going to be disproven but because i think it's going to be disproven it actually gets proven to be true rather than be true proven false which is my initial presupposition is that everything that i'm trying to come at from a research perspective is going to be false and so that's why you have to also analyze your assumptions and your biases and make the assumption that a belief is taken for granted. Then it becomes a bias. It's like I'm biased toward the big five model of personality just because it's the most empirically reliable based on the different instruments that measure out big five. And that's, of course, the NEO PIR. That's the NEO Personality Inventory Revised. There's the AB5 uh ipip which is the abridged big five international person or personality inventory pool or item pool is what it means so and of course there's the big five aspect scales so those are three of the most reliable and valid measures for measuring personality whereas you have the myers-briggs inventory of types which i think has like a validity of like 0.4 and it's not it doesn't reliably measure consistently when you when you measure it so it's it's not it's not a, it's not a good measure at all so you you know you try to avoid those biases and you know that's why i go by with uh reliability and validity based uh numbers when it comes to instruments uh avoid emotional reasoning like i said just because you feel it's true doesn't mean it is and you can use that in any aspect of your life you know for the example, if you have a feeling that your partner might not be, uh, might not be necessarily uh, faithful to you because you might have like these suspicions that you have, but just because you feel it's true doesn't mean it is. So you don't want to go confront your wife for sneaking around on you when, in fact, she's just getting you like a surprise birthday party put together. So she's having to be a little more secretive than normal because she doesn't want you to ruin your birthday surprise and so you end up getting egg on your face and so try to avoid that in pretty much all aspects of psychological research and in your real life do not oversimplify look beyond the obvious things that are complicated and to oversimplify things tends to lead to intellectual fallacies that's where you get into these debates i don't know if you've ever seen any deb debates online but for example you'll see like uh I keep going back to this one. It's one of my favorite examples of seeing oversimplifications is uh, the Jordan Peterson, Kathy Newman uh, debate slash interview that um, she did. She didn't take a, much of a liking to Peterson's presuppositions in his book, 12 Worlds for Life. 
And so in this debate, she kept oversimplifying his position to the point that it was becoming a caricature of that. So she was committing what's called a straw man fallacy. She was taking a position that he didn't have and and attacking that rather than actually attacking the ideas. And it's easy to do in debates. That's why I generally try to stay away from them because it's so easy to straw man. Because a lot of people, when they come up with their positions, what they don't like to do is they'll work on their position, but they won't work on the counter position. Or if they do, it'll be like this oversimplified version of the opposition to their position, and then they'll attack that. And that's, again, attacking a straw man. And uh, I would say the best way to do things if you're trying to come up with a position is to make the strongest case as if that was your position and to argue against your actual position. Because if you can make a strong steel man or iron man of that argument against your position and then you try to tear that apart, then you can kind of tell just how strong your initial presupposition is and whether or not you need to abandon it or not. So don't oversimplify your position and don't oversimplify somebody else's. And so that, that's just a thing that you really need to take a look at. Uh, consider other interpretation interpretations. So you need to generate as many interpretations of evidence and then, of course, sep settle on the most simple. That goes back to Occam's razor. That goes back to the simplest explanation is usually the most true. And so that's one of the things you can do is you can generate many different interpretations of your data and then settle on the most simple, and it'll usually be the most true, and then you can retest it and see how strong it is. Also, tolerate uncertainty, because critically thinking allows you to tolerate uncertainty, especially if there's very little evidence to examine, because sometimes you might have a really good experiment set up and the data comes back terrible, or you don't get as much data as you hoped you had, and so you can tolerate that and be like, okay, what can I do to make my experiment better? Or what can, what, how can I more precisely define my terms? And that's something we'll get into in the next lecture about you know, psychology as a science and, and being precise in your definition. So that's definitely something we want to take a look at in the, in the next lecture. But yeah, you want to have, be able to tolerate as much uncertainty as you possibly can. I think that's, that's an important thing to remember when it comes to thinking critically. The psychological tree. Okay, so you can think of psychology as this tree, and there's all these different branches of, of psychology, and this is my conceptualization. It might work out for you. It might not. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. So psychological practitioners work in many different areas. You have counseling. You have diagnosing and treating severe mental disorders. Uh, there's different ways that it's done. Um, and for many of those uh, those types of psychological Practitioners, you either have to have a PhD or a PsyD, uh, sometimes a master's. If you're doing counseling, you can get away with like a master's of counseling or a master's of clinical social work. Uh, you can be an MD if you practice psychiatry, which is a medical specialization in mental disorders and mental illnesses. And so people often confuse the clinical psychologist, the psychotherapist, the psychoanalyst, and the psychiatrist. And it's easy to do because in the past, these were all kind of intermingled. So you have these like five branches of, of, of psychology. You could just look at my hand here. You could say you have five branches of psychology, but at one time it was just like this big gnarled bunch. So, and that's because like Sigmund Freud, as we talked about, was a neurologist, but he came up with the idea of psychoanalysis as a treatment for mental disorders. And of course, Jung was a, was a psychiatrist and yet he was into psychoanalysis, the unconscious. He came up with the idea of psychological types, which became the, the, the groundwork or the foundation for personality psychology. And so, but he was a psychiatrist. And so now you, you can see that they're, how it gets all confused. So psychotherapists are simply people who do any kind of psychotherapy. Many of counselors who have uh, graduate degrees, whether it's a master's in counseling, a master's in social work, uh, they hold licensing. A lot of states have you have to be licensed to be a psychotherapist. You have psychoanalysts. These are typically uh, MDs, PhDs, and they get the training outside the university or internship setting. There's actual institutes that they teach you to do psychoanalysis. There's one here near Richmond. It's called the Baltimore Washington Psychoanalytic Institute. 
and they teach you to do psychoanalysis. Um, we talked about psychiatrists. They're MDs that specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of mental disorders. Now, what makes them different from a clinical psychologist is they take a purely biological approach and they treat the disorders with medication and they do not do therapy like they used to. You don't see psychiatrists typically doing psychotherapy. They usually will they'll diagnose you for like say depression if you're if you're having a major depressive episode you go see a psychiatrist they give you medication typically an ssri and then they'll refer you to either a clinical social worker or a clinical counselor or they might even send refer you to a clinical psychologist for psychotherapy as well as you know additional diagnostics just in case they may have missed the mark because that's the thing about clinical is if you're a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist, you're almost like an engineer because you're trying to build something. You're trying to make something work. So if someone comes to you and you're a clinical psychologist and they say, I'm having this problem and this problem and this problem, it's like, okay, we have to sort out all the problems, figure out what is biologic and what is actually going on because it could be just your life isn't going typically very well. And if your life isn't going well, we need to figure out why it's not going well. And then we need to sort that out so that way we can kind of whether it's using you know psychotherapy as well as medication to get you going so so yeah the psycho psychological tree has all these different branches and you know where i work at a, at a psychiatric facility you actually see like social workers psychiatrists and clinical psychologists all working together in treatment teams to actually maximize the efficiency that we can that, that people get themselves sorted out so that way they can get out of the hospital and get back to a relatively normal life. And so that's kind of an important thing to, to note. So like I said, there's five approaches that are the most dominant in psychology today, and that's the biological perspective, the learning perspective, the cognitive perspective, the sociocultural perspective, and the psychodynamic perspective. And so we're going to talk about those. So the biological perspective focuses on how bodily events affect your behavior, your feelings, and your thoughts. This is the idea that like, for example, like uh, your life might be going extremely well, but you might have no energy. You might feel sad and hopeless. You might be content contemplating ending your own life. And you have no reason to understand you, you you can't see anything in your life that's actually causing you any sort of problem and so it might be biologic so your brain just might not take up as much serotonin as it should and so you know with an ssri that means that you take up more uh serotonin and your mood improves more positive emotion more motivation to get you you know back to feeling as close to normal as you can there might be some psychotherapy to kind of help out with that, but it's mostly could be something going on biologically. And so another thing about the biological perspective is this is where psychologists tend to look at the electrical impulses that shoot through the nervous system, hormones that are let loose in the bloodstream, like adrenaline. It's a, it's cortisol. Cortisol is a good one because it's a stress hormone. It makes your heart rate increase, makes you breathe in. It makes your breathing more rapid. Uh, they might look at skin conductivity because your palms tend to sweat, so you might, you know, have more electrical conductivity in your palms and stuff like that, and that might have to deal with like anger, or if you're, or, or looking at just, you know, other types of stress that can affect the human body. And they'll look at, you know, how your organs are going to react, or how the chemical messengers, those are neuro, neuro uh, neurochemicals uh, like serotonin, dopamine. I f they're called uh oh crap i can't think of the name right off the top of my head neurotransmitters that's what i'm looking at they're, they're neurotransmitters in the brain and so these chemical messengers are neurotransmitters they flow across what's called synapses and these are they're, they're the tiny gaps between like human neurons so you might have a synapse at the end and then you might have a synaptic bulb at the other end and so the neurochemical kind of travels in between the the synaptic bulb and the synapse and that's kind of how those electrical signals in the brain keep going down and of course that'll affect like your physiology and stuff like that so that's kind of what neuropsychologists kind of tend to look at 
They also study how a biological process can affect memory, performance, perceptions of reality, the experience of emotion, how mood disorders have roots in biology, that's depression, bipolar affective disorder, schizophrenia is a mental disorder that's uh, more of a neurocognitive degenerative mental illness. And they also have this stake between the old nurture versus nature debates, especially in the development of personality and personality traits. And you could also look at evolutionary psychology as another branch of biological. So you have neuropsychology and you have evolutionary psychology. And what evolutionary psychology looks at is just how our ancestors in our past may explain some of our present behavior and psychological traits. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so you can look at evolutionary psychology and actually apply it within multiple facets of psychology. And so one of the ones that, that I look at is psychology of religious belief and ideology. And, you know, it's a perfect example of how biological perspective can be applied. Why is it that we look at snakes as representations of, of, of evil or why is it that we don't like snakes? Well, we share a common ancestor with, ang and with chimpanzees and there and and so that common ancestor were probably you know the prey animal of a large snake and so through that we abstracted snake as predator and looked at that abstract of snake as predator to a meta snake which is like the adversary of mankind and in that it became this mythological representation that you know we f form monsters or dragons in fact, if you've read uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, Satan actually took the form of a serpent when he supposedly brought down the fall of mankind if you follow religious mythology. And so what's interesting about that is it's known with chimpanzees that are in habitats where you find predators, snakes as predators, that some chimpanzees have what's called a snake ra, W-R-A-A. -A. And so – it's this loud noise that basically means like, holy shit, there's a big snake over there. And I mean that literally because there's interesting documentation in the literature for, for – uh, in the neurology of chimpanzees that the circuit that they use for that snake noise is the same circuit in humans where you start to see guttural effective la – effect-laden curses. So – like in with Tourette's syndrome, which is a disorder, a neurological disorder, basically in that same circuit that's in that predator detection and alarm circuit, if something goes haywire in there, you find people with Tourette's syndrome that tend to curse a lot, have that 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 predator detection alarm system is active in their brain, and it's the same thing that's in the chimpanzees when they make that snake raw sound, and so that's that's where evolutionary psychology kind of makes that leap, and so. So that's kind of interesting how you can look at evolutionary psychology and how we look at things in our representations and be able to trace it back through our through the evolutionary record. There's the learning perspective. And you know, it's like you know, uh, Pavlov and his dogs. And there that's what the image here is you have a dog looking at dog food and salivating, and then someone kind of rings the bell, and the dog does nothing. But if you give the dog food and he salivates, and then you ring the bell while he's salivating, and you do that enough times that if you ring the bell, the dog will think food, and the dog will salivate. And so there's this old psychology joke about, like, has, any, has anybody here ever heard of Pavlov? And someone will say, well, I think the name rings a bell. There you go. And so this perspective is, you know, concerned more with environmental and exper experiential impacts on a person or animal's actions. And this learning perspective was uh, was basically led by what was considered the behaviorists or the behaviorist movement in psychology. Uh, one of the first behaviors was a, a psychologist by the name of John B. Watson, and he published this paper in 1913 about psychology as a behaviorist views it. And so he argued that for psychology to become an objective science rather than just, you know, philosophy, and, you know, to kind of break away from like Freud and the psychoanalysts and all of that, he, he said, you know, the mind would have to be kind of abandoned and put to the back burner. Let the, let the psychoanalysts handle that, and then, you know, for psychology as an objective science, they would have to stick only to observed measurable phenomena based on 
bodily reactions to stimuli and, and, and looking at how like your, your neuro processes cause you to behave a certain way based on your environment and your exper experiential factors. And Watson, of course, was <laughs> influenced by the psychologist from Russia. He was actually a physiologist. He was a and he was his name was Ivan Pavlov, and he's the one that did the salivating dog experiment, where he showed that you can get um, involuntary behavior as a learned behavior, and that's the salivating for food, which dogs salivate for food. It's an involuntary behavior, but they can learn to do it by associating it with a bell ringing. And of course, the image on the screen kind of lays that out for you. And so, you know, we can take the, there's no real laser pointer, but we'll go ahead and take the, the little marker. So I'm gonna use red, so it'll stick out. So like I said, you have right here, you have the dog looking at the bowl, salivating, and this is before conditioning. And so then dirt before conditioning, you would, you know, ring the bell and that is a terrible circle. I apologize for that, but you can see that ring the bell, the dog's not going to do anything. You might run away from the bell, you might not like the bell, but during conditioning, you, you bring the dog food, he salivates, you ring the bell while you bring the food. So that way the bell, the food and the salivating all kind of go together. And then of course my computer screen where my camera is i'm going to cut my camera out real quick but you can kind of see right here with after the conditioning you ring in the bell the dog's going to salivate and you can kind of see that the dog is salivating at the at the at the bell there so yeah so that's kind of how the conditioning works. I think it, I think the word for it is operant conditioning. You can kind of do that. There, there's a there's a clip. If you ever watch uh, The Office, and that's a that's a funny show. But there's a there's Dwight, who's the dude with glasses, and then there's I think it's Jim is the other dude. And so Jim would make this ding sound and offer Dwight a piece of candy, and he would just make the ding sound, offer candy, make the ding cell sound, offer candy and then he got to the point where he made the ding sound and Dwight just puts his hand out for the candy without any candy being offered so he kind of conditioned him to to behave that way so that's that's kind of another example of that and of course keeping on with behaviors there's another psychologist he's kind of famous he's B.F. Skinner and he identified the behavioral laws regarding voluntary behaviors and he showed that the consequences of behaviors affected the behaviors themselves and so pleasant consequences tend to promote certain behaviors and unpleasant consequences tend to make certain behaviors cease so this became known as positive and negative reinforcement if you positively reinforce behavior you'll get more instances of that behavior or if you use negative reinforcement and punishers you tend to see the undesired behavior tend to stop however it became apparent that behaviorism alone couldn't account for learning and so that's because people also learn by observation. They learn by imitation. That's a Piagetian idea. And I do plan on talking about Piaget in this course. I don't think Piaget is really talked about in the book a whole lot. So we might have to deviate from the textbook a bit just to bring, you know, to really talk about Piaget and insight. And so this led to what's called the social cognitive learning theory, which means that you're learning through imitation, you're processing the information and learning the behavior at the same time the cognitive perspective this is actually kind of fun I'm, I'm i study mostly personality personally but i think i think cognitive science and cognitive psychology is actually very fascinating so i'm very excited to talk about this so this emphasis in psychology came as a result of the development of the computer already the learning theorists were starting to recognize the importance of cognition the computer just kind of ramped things up and so cognitive psychologists have made tremendous contributions to the research in memory because memory doesn't occur like a video recorder like we always thought it's actually stored uh encoded into the brain and then uh has to be recalled it's often reconstructed in parts and other parts are kind of made up because memories don't come out 100 complete 
And so this is kind of where a lot of research into false memories tend to focus, and that actually um, was a big thing in the 1980s about false memories. There was a thing called the Satanic Panic. I don't know if any of you guys remember this, but there was a so right, back, right about the 1980s, you know, heavy metal was the thing, and you had some of the rock bands were playing around with satanic imagery. Uh, in the 70s, Dungeons and Dragons had come out, and so that was kind of a big underground like culture there of, of gaming and playing D and D and listening to metal. Uh, Tolkien was really big in the 60s and 70s. There was the animated version of The Hobbit that was uh, relatively popular at the time, and all of this kind of expanded outward and parents started to kind of get worried about the corruption of their children and so there was a there was a daycare out in california where it was alleged that like the the people running it were uh, sexually abusing the children and then it kind of got blown out to so so some of these things weren't even real right so so the accusations were false but as time went on, it became it went from like uh, caretakers abusing children to they were part of these satanic cults and the government was hiding it and and so it just caused this massive thing. People were trying to get D and D banned. Uh, there was a, a major censorship thing going on. The as far as music goes, like especially in the heavy heavy metal music, there was the the PMRC in the 80s. It was headed by Tipper Gore, and so they were trying to put the little Parental advisory stickers on CDs. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen that, and I don't want to leave the chair to go get a CD out of here to point the little sticker. But basically, they worried about the corruption of youth, and so they were getting uh, warning labels put on CDs for explicit content. They went after bands like Wasp, which were a I, I want to say they were more like a hair metal band. They they were a metal band, but they were like more hair metal. I mean. But they, they had some controversial songs, and, and they played around with satanic imagery. They kind of went with uh, – they went after Twisted Sister over the song We're Not Gonna Take It Anymore with, like, the cartoon violence that they emulated in their music video for that song. In fact, D. Snyder actually went and testified before Congress saying, you know, you know, we're not satanic. This is just art, and you really shouldn't censor that and all of this, but – Going back to the, the, the false memory focus is because of the satanic panic or whatever, it came to find out that a lot of the people that were interviewing these kids, they didn't really understand how memory worked. And so they were actually asking them leading questions, and these kids were constructing false memories and reporting them as if they were true. And there was no truth to them whatsoever at all. And so it, it and so we now know that, you know, there's partial reconstruction, and so you have to you have to take kind of memory recall with a bit of a grain of salt because there are going to be some gaps in the memory and stuff there. And uh, this perspective also investigates how people interpret things, uh, affect emo how they affect emotions, uh, how behaviors are affected from cognitive. In short, it's basically how mental processes affect perception, memory, language, emotion, and problem solving as long along with behavior. And so the cognitive scientists and the cognitive psychologists have looked at the human cognitive processes and compared the mind to a couple of different metaphors. And, and so there's, there, there's the mind as a computer, and then there's the Watts governor. So the mind as a computer metaphor is very interesting. They basically, they look at – they think of the brain as this uh, – uh, in a computational, representational understanding of the mind or crumb for short. Basically, the input is processed into the brain, it's stored, and then it's later recalled, and it doesn't happen as quickly as, like, say, in an actual computer processor. And so they thought it was like a Turing machine, that if you put input in, you would get input out kind of thing. Whereas other cognitive scientists came up with this idea of the Watts governor, and it looked at the processes as more dynamic. So the more input comes in and the more input you need out, the Watts governor kind of it's kind of like an engine kind of going, so you're trying to make these calculations at a, at a very quick speed and in a much faster motion than a Turing machine or, or the computational representation understanding of the mind could ever do. And so they kind of looked at, at the Watts governor metaphor as like in-body cognition. You can think of that as if you've ever watched uh, 
what is it, American Ninja Warrior, where you've got like all those obstacles and they're ever changing. And so you have to change and adapt and you have to do these calculations and geometry and physics and everything else. And you're, you're doing it unconsciously, but you're having to constantly adjust your body and, and how you do things in relation to these obstacles to get through the obstacle course in the quickest amount of time. And so the embodied cognition or the watch governor, that's the best way you could look at that is because you're, you're having to constantly adjust where you're at cognitively based on where you're at in your body. And so this embodied cognition frame work has led, you know, what's known as the frame problem. And the frame problem is, it's an artificial intelligence problem. And it's, 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 goes back to you know we, we were talking about in the first lecture about like some of the the postmodern uh, philosophers like Immanuel Kant for example and Kant made a really good point about categories how we categorize things well so the frame problem lays out the question of how might logic based event representations be specifically let me let me undo my camera here cuz i can't see the word Okay, so basically the frame problem lays out how the question of how might logic-based event representations be specified so that artificial information processors could actually make appropriate associations to and draw meaningful inferences from such events. And so it's like basically looking at meaning uh, of, of what do things mean. So you can have a robot try to pick up a block. And that's simple enough, pick up block. But what about all the things that are about that block that, that make it, that block unique into itself? Because if you say put block in square peg, well, it's gonna pick up the block, put it in a square hole. But what if the block's bigger than the square hole? Or what if it's smaller? So that's what artificial information processing wouldn't be able to do is figure out the, the meaning of block, the meaning of square hole, relation to size, and all of that. And so that's one of the things that I thought was very interesting was, th was the frame problem. And it's a problem with artificial intelligence is how are, uh, how are they going to make those meaningful associations between things to where they can make the same decisions that humans make to if so, because the singularity I think that's what it's called. It's like the sing singularity, or where uh, machines are capable to, to capable to do the same things that humans do cognitively, kind of thing. The sociocultural perspective emphasizes social and cultural attitudes and forces that shape behaviors and attitudes. So this perspective kind of rose out of World War II when questions were. How could dictators like, say, Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin uh, were able to persuade people to commit the atrocities that occurred in the 20th century? And we're talking, you know, the Holocaust in Nazi Germany and, of course, you know, people reporting on one another and to be sent to the to the concentration camps up in Siberia. And so within this perspective, social psychologists study how social roles and rules influence groups of people like why do people obey authority because that was the big nuremberg defense and not during after world war ii with a lot of the nazi generals and officers was when well, we were following orders and they look at how individuals relate to one another and how those relationships develop in the individual mode of individual's mode of being because uh, when it comes to um the experiments where they come, like the Milgram experiment, experiment or the Stanford prison experiment were experiments in authority and behaviors. And so what's interesting is Stanley Milgram's experiment about like if you're told basically he had a – he would have a – you would have a person sitting at a, at a booth pressing a button, asking questions, and they would have – Another person in another room answering questions, and every time the question was answered wrong, the person pushing the button was told to push the button and turn the turn the dial, and the dial was supposed to represent how many volts of electricity you were shocking a person with. And because the scientists portrayed this authority figure, they were seeing just how far people were willing to go because of an authority figure time they, to continue administering the shock even though they knew it was morally wrong. So that's one instance of deference to authority. Uh, 
The Stanford Prison Experiment is a really interesting book. I highly or experiment. I, I highly recommend the book. It's called The Lucifer Effect: How Good People Turn Evil. And it's by uh, Dr. Philip Zimbardo. And so the prison experiment was interesting because he had 24 students. 12 uh, were to play prisoners. The other 12 were to play guards. And I think this experiment lasted like maybe a week before it was asked to be shut down because, uh, well, they, they basically – you saw dehumanizing behavior, deference to authority, submission to authority, and cruelty. And so basically – it was considered a moral experiment because we actually learned something, and that's how do you make a bunch of fascist barbarians in less than a week's time? And it's give them a sense of inflated authority over other people, and then you kind of just let things kind of develop, and you start to see dehumanization, and, and and then you know the cruelty tends to tends to manifest itself. There's another book that really lays that out really well. It's called a uh, Ordinary Men by uh, Robert – I think it's Robert or Christopher – it's Christopher Browning, and it's uh, called Ordinary Men. It's about these poli – this police battalion in Poland during World War II, and they were just sent in to kind of maintain order and, and all of that, but they ended up being cajoled into uh, committing some of the most horrible atrocities in Poland. Uh, when it came to their role in the final solution, so it's it's, it's a, a highly recommend the book to read if you want to understand how people can do some pretty horrible things in some pretty not so normal conditions. Uh, so continuing on the social socio cultural perspective, what we have here is we have Jonathan Haidt, and he's a social psychologist who studies morality. And he authored books like The Happiness Hypothesis, The Righteous Mind, How Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, and his most recent book, The Calling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, who he wrote with uh, Greg Lukianoff. And that, kind of, that book, as I was talking about earlier when we were talking about like why you need to think critically in psychology, is he lays out like the three great untruths that we're seeing today, and one of it's always trust your feelings and all of that. Now, uh, his research in morality was has furthered how we look at disgust and moral disgust because one of the things that he's thought of is he came up with this questionnaire of, and, and was rating it like how people felt or how much disgust they felt. And when it came to like moral ambiguous situations, like there's ones like if your dog dies – and you take it in your house and you cook and eat it and nobody knows about it, is that moral? And the cognitive dissonance, because most people are like, well, if nobody sees it, it's not really wrong, but it, you know that disgust was there. So he's kind of looking at moral disgust. And through his work, he, he produced what what's called the moral foundations theory, in which he explains the moral matrices of liberals, conservatives, and libertarians and their moral foundations on how they look at the world. So – <clears throat> he, he wrote about that in The Righteous Mind, and it was basically an idea of how liberals, libertarians, and conservatives kind of look at the world in a way to where you could try to bring people together instead of them kind of like going at each other forcefully or, or tearing, you know, just coming apart really in that, that division you see in, in the world, in the political landscape. And so Jonathan Haidt wanted to kind of figure out, well, okay, what's the moral foundations or what is the, the – groundwork for those for those worldviews and he kind of looked at you know because it's the same thing with religion too and so yeah it's a really good book i highly recommend it height also founded the heterodox account academy that basically brought people together with uh very different viewpoints in the uh, in the spirit of open inquiry is basically what they were looking for was you know basically and when he did his he was doing some research into the universities and especially after uh, the righteous mind came out he was looking at university uh, the university environments and found that the social sciences and the humanities tend to tilt disproportionately more hard left and so you don't see a whole lot of conservatives in like social sciences or the humanities for that matter. And so we thought, you know, of getting 
conservatives and liberal types together to, to for the common goal of open inquiry to, to, to find truth and stuff like that and to you know bring people together instead of this this disproportionate representation of political worldviews. And so that's that's Jonathan Haidt. So that's a good example of what social psychologists do. Cultural psychologists focus primarily on how the cultural landscape as an environment affects human development. So one example is like how in the West where an individual – the individual is sovereign uh, type of culture versus the Asian and Latin um, collectivist cultures. And so – and there's also cultural attitudes of like emotion. So for the example I include, there's anger, outbursts of anger, anger for example. It's frowned upon in a collective culture because group harmony is valued higher than the individual expression. So most people tend to internalize their anger because they don't want to disru disrupt, you know, whether it's family harmony, workplace harmony. So that group harmony in, in that collective type society is more important. Whereas here in the West, you know, we want you to deal with your anger in a healthy express it in a healthy way so that way it doesn't stay bottled up and then it gets expressed in an unhealthy way that tends to either get you put in jail or a psychiatric hospital if it's you know part of a, a personality disorder or a co or a conduct disorder so so you know again with individualist societies we tend to want to see emotion more openly expressed than rather be suppressed for the sake of a group har of group harmony and the sociocultural perspective has also become a dominant force in psychology because we are social creatures and we are affected by our history, the groups we belong to, and our differences in cultural landscapes. In fact, that's one of the ways that personality is built is basically like if I'm interacting with someone, they're telling me what they want and what they don't want. In the same way, I'm telling someone what I want and what I do not want. So that constant interaction is kind of what builds along that part of that personality. So like that's why personality is a biopsychosocial construct, it's not rooted in one or the other. It's all three intermingled together. And, uh, and so now we're going to get into the psychodynamics, the psychodynamics uh, perspective. And this perspective looks at the unconscious dynamics of the individual. You can think of it as uh, if you look at psychology as the hand, the psychodynamic perspectives like the thumb. So it, it's kind of there with all the other ones, but it's kind of out here on its own because it's set apart in terms of language methods and standards. And it's grounded in Freudian psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalysis. And many psychologists think that this perspective is best confined to literature and philosophy. I don't agree with that just because we do have things that go on in our on our unconscious it's kind of like again you know real real life situation there there was a patient that i worked with that um really showed the archetype of a trickster kind of the more menacing uh the goddess heiress you know throws the apple of discord and causes chaos around for their own amusement it's more ma malevolent in its manifestations it's not like a simple gesture who says something funny that, that makes fun of someone but yet tells the truth this is causing absolute chaos and discord like an like an actual trickster it's like a like a hobgoblin kind of thing that's another archetypal representation of a trickster and so that archetypal representation is an un, is a, that archetype manifests itself unconsciously because that person acts it out without knowing that's what they're acting out and so that's why i think the psychodynamic perspective is not just to be thrown into the philosophy and literature books, but it's actually a very valid mode of psychology. And I have a lot of respect for the psychoanalysts, especially Carl Jung. So this perspective is still valuable to psychotherapists. It's it's valuable to clin any clinician, counselor, psychotherapist worth his or her salt. And many of those that followed and even broke from Freud continue believing that the unconscious influences thinking and behavior. And uh, Jung is more associated with this perspective due to his theories of the collective unconscious, 
which he vastly expanded on the psychoanalytic methods that, that Freud had established. But there was a lot of heartbreaking science there that Jung also did as well that I don't think people tend to be aware of. And so we have this iceberg here, and I'm going to go ahead and kind of hide the camera view. So you have the conscious. That's, that's the tip of the iceberg that you see. That's ideas, thoughts, feelings that we are all aware of. Then you get into the material that can be easily recalled. You can think of this as like your memory. That's the pre-conscious. You have the ego. That's the self. That's a union presupposition, the self, the reality principle. You have the superego. That's your moral guardian, your, I, your ego's ideal. So your superego is like the forces of society that are kind of internalized upon you. Then you kind of have the unconscious. That's below the surface awareness of, of in the water of the unconscious. And that's, you know, you're going to find your unconscious urges, your desires, the pleasure principle. That's the id. You could think of that as where your anima and animus and your shadow all hides. And then, of course, you think of the water as like a collective unconscious. That's, like I said, I think that's the... That's the archetypal representations that you unconsciously learn through imitation, through your peers, your family, all and, and all of that. That that's the societal substrate of the collective unconscious, as far as I'm concerned. And so that's kind of how that works. Now we're going to talk about two influential movements in psychology, and. So you, the first one is humanist psychology. So Carl Rogers, among others, but Carl Rogers is the most well-known psychologist and, and therapist and, and was the one that really was the forefront of the humanist uh, movement. Then they rejected the psychoanalytic view of the unconscious, calling it too pessimistic. They said it was – it, it wasn't really giving the human capacity for resilience its, its due. And they also rejected the behaviorist approach because it's too mindless and mechanistic. They, they said that what they needed was a human-centered, humanist perspective. And so this is kind of like any anytime you've taken a psychology course or you've taken any sort of courses in like uh, leadership, like if you've ever been promoted at work, they talk about active listening, listening to what someone's saying, reflecting what they said back to them so that way – they understand that you understand what they're saying. So, you know, if they agree that you understand what they're coming from, then you can kind of move that conversation forward. You see that a lot in uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. You see it a lot in, 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 in debates. Like if I've ever got into a conversation with someone that gets – typically kind of gets out of hand, I always try to – and I don't always I don't always succeed with it. It's something I'm still working on, but the idea of – okay, your position is, and then restate it back to them and be like, is this correct? And then moving the conversation forward. And so that's kind of become a major modality used with psychotherapists and even outside the psychological circles, even in you know a lot of debates, uh, do it especially if you see a lot of sit-down discussions. A good example of this acting itself out is uh, – Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson did a series of debates slash discussions on religion, and uh, Jordan would you know always try to reflect what Sam was saying back to him to make sure that he understood what Sam was going from, and then try to move that conversation forward. And so that's active listening as you can see it. And so, and of course, the humanist movement did allow for things like happiness and creative creativity to be measured objectively. That's where, you know. <clears throat> creativity runs along what's called a Pareto distribution, P-A-R-E-T-O. And basically, you can it's it's an 80-20 rule. It's it's a square root rule. So so like uh, out of a hundred people that write books, ten of them will probably be published. Out of those ten that are published, three will be highly successful kind of things, and they fall along that Pareto distribution. And so the humanist – so humanist psychology can basically be summed up as a psychological approach that emphasizes personal growth and the achievement of, 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 human, oh, of human potential. And so that's, uh, that's the humanist nutshell, really, and, uh, that the humanist 
movement in a nutshell. Feminist psychology. So this perspective emerged in the 1970s, questioning the biases in psychology because most psychologists for a long time were predominantly men. They were mostly men. They were all men, let's be honest. And that many studies only used men as subjects. And so they make note that it was mostly white middle class men. And this had inappropriately generalized everyone's narrow data. So today, both men and women who identify as feminist psychologists may identify with any of the five major perspectives from any of them for analyzing gender relations and behavior. Feminist psychologists have also spurred research into other topics like menstruation, motherhood, power and sexual dynamics and relationships, as well as the definitions of masculinity and femininity, gender roles and sexist attitudes. And this is kind of where you start to see associations between psychologists and, and, and psychology and, and social justice emerge as they tend to analyze the social consequences and the justifications for lower status for the lower status of women and other disadvantaged groups that were based in research. So basically their presupposition is uh, is Looking at empirical evidence, they were saying that their presupposition was that people were treating disadvantaged people and women as lesser than because of the basis of their research. That's their presupposition, and I think that that's a, that's a terrible misreading of, of history. That's kind of my opinion on it, and, and we're going to talk about the criticisms here because critics are both found inside and outside of that movement. And one of the criticisms uh, were that feminists had become radicalized and were replacing male bias with female bias by doing studies that revolved around women only or only using women or you know trying to push men out of out of psychological studies. There's also been criticism of the idea of a tyrannical patriarchy. That's that's another thing that you start to see in radical feminism is that history is perceived as you know a long time of domination of women by men and that's absolutely couldn't be more untrue than anything else was there times that things were pretty unfair for women absolutely but I would say for the most period that men and women have done a pretty good job of cooperating throughout history because if you look at history in the long term history is a big bloodbath and I mean Things are so much better now than they ever were and so to sit there and say that 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 all the bad things that have happened in history has been as a consequence of tyrannical male or patriarchal male tyranny i think is an absolute nonsense and uh there's also a criticism that focuses on equality of outcome and gender equality saying that you know everything has to have an equal outcome or else the 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 evidence is is biased and and no good and so one of the other criticisms is that when it comes to gender equality in these studies is that the conclusions that are being embraced lack a solid em empirical foot to stand on. So it lacks solid empirical support and evidence to support those conclusions. And so it's not just not just me over here in my in my office presenting this. It, the, 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 there are that's in the book that says that these criticisms are there. These aren't just my criticisms of it. So in conclusion of this section, going back to the first lecture, lecture, you know, psychology is the study of the human mind and how humans behave. However, there are some pseudoscientific competitors with psychologists, and these are like astrologers and psychics and tarot readers and all of that. And the only reason why I think tarot readers are a little bit higher in credibility than, say, regular psychics or astrologers is because of the archetypal representations on the cards and the way they do their readings. I'd say is more rooted in psychoanalysis and psychodynamic theory than it is like pseudoscience. That's how they act out. Now, whether they know that or not, I think there's another conversation that can be had. Now, one benefit of studying psychology is the development of critical thinking skills. These skills, uh, these are skills to distinguish between beliefs based on personal preference and taste versus beliefs based on evidence. Wundt, as you'll recall, from the first first or second lecture when we start talking about the pro-psychologists 
Uh, his views were based in observation and the measurement of functional processes. And William James here in the U.S. was also propelled by those ideas that, that lurked behind that functionalist lens. And of course, psychology leading toward like psychotherapy that it, of course began with Freud as we talked about Freud in, at length. In fact, we had a whole lecture devoted to Freud who emphasized that the unconscious drives of mental and behavioral processes were the reason for mental disorders. And so his psychoanalytic methods of treating those mental illnesses gave birth to the psychotherapeutic modalities that we see being used today, like cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, uh, psychoanalysis is still used. There's uh, logotherapy, gestalt therapy. I mean, there's all kinds of things. So psychology is a really dynamic field where you can have many outcomes from studying it, whether you want to be a psychological researcher, a psychotherapist, or even a professor of psychology. So, you know, those are all different outcomes you can have from studying psychology. Psychotherapists is considered an unregulated term that includes clinical psychologists, psychoanalysts, uh, psychiatrists, rarely do. We see counselors with different postgraduate degrees and you know state licenses to be able to practice uh, doing that. Um, there's five, the five major perspectives we talked about that. That was you know biological, learning, cognitive, social, cultural, and psychodynamic. We talked about the two influential movements within psychology: the humanist method, and I highly recommend uh, Carl Rogers' book, A Way of. I think it's called like a way of being or something like that. It's a really good book. I highly recommend it. And of course, we talked about feminist psychology. And the, the main idea is to actively not fall in a trap of reductionism when it comes to your personal and social issues. And so it's good to draw more than one perspective. You can't just come at everything from purely psychodynamic. You can't be strictly biologic or sociocultural. It all has to come together. That's how that works is all has to come together to work. All right, these are the references for this, and I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. And uh, we'll be talking about the study of human behavior. I think is the next uh, section of lectures from the from the textbook. So thank you guys. If you enjoyed what you, if you enjoyed the lecture, su subscribe, leave a comment. I will answer comments. If you have any questions, I'll definitely answer them. You can also catch this lecture on my podcast, the Table Talks podcast on SoundCloud. Um, thank you guys. And I hope you enjoyed.